As I mentioned in the previous lecture, I would like to draw your attention to two movements within the history of contemporary literature. The first of these is existentialism. As in our normal lectures, I'd like to begin with an example. Consider the following story. A certain epidemic is wreaking havoc in Oran, a town in Algiers. All citizens are ordered to quarantine at home. The local doctor works around the clock to save victims. There are acts of heroism and acts of shame. There are those who think only of themselves and those who are engaged for the greater good. Obviously, this story resonates with the present context in which we find ourselves, unfortunately unable to leave our homes and in constant fear of the fact that we may catch a deadly virus. In recent weeks, indeed, there has been an eruption of interest in so-called pestilence fiction. The example that I'm giving here was published in 1947. It forms the basis of a novel by the French-Algerian writer Albert Camus, who was titled La Peste, or The Plague. The work is an account of the determined fight against an epidemic. In the course of the past weeks, sales of this novel have soared. The work is experiencing a revival because its description of life during an epidemic resonates with the present. This novel doesn't give permission to despair, but works out the complex hope that the current crisis, current then as it is now, might lead to a better future. As Camus writes, on the whole, men are more good than bad. That, however, isn't the real point. But they are more or less ignorant, and it is that which we call vice or virtue. The most incorrigible vice being that of an ignorance which fancies it knows everything and therefore claims for itself the right to kill. Why is this novel an example of existentialism? According to existentialism, there is no source of meaning outside of the self, such as God or nature or the nation. Without such a transcendent source of meaning, we cannot explain why we are here on this earth. My description of this condition might ring a few bells and make you recall certain other art movements that we see in previous courses. And making this diagnosis, indeed, existentialism is not that different from modernism but the response that existentialism provides is different. Modernist writers responded to the fact that the world is intrinsically meaningless by dramatizing the breakdown and fragmentation of the self. Existentialist writers, on the other hand, respond that there is such a thing as a sincere or authentic self, and that it is by living an authentic life and by taking responsibility for our actions that we can give meaning to our existence in the world. As a movement, existentialism first came into being in France after the Second World War. As I mentioned in the first lecture, many of the isms that we are studying today were coined in this period. It is at this point in history that theories of culture began to exert a major influence on literary practice. Existentialism is a very good example. As we will see today, existentialist concerns were adumbrated in various languages in the decades before the war. It was during the war, however, that writers began to trace this prehistory and to identify themselves as existentialists. During the war, three French writers played a key role in transforming existentialism into a major literary movement. If you would like to learn more about the history of existentialism and these figures, I can recommend Sarah Bakewell's At the Existentialist's Café, Freedom Being an Apricot Cocktails. The first of the writers that you see sitting here in the middle is Simone de Beauvoir, whose work set in motion the first wave of feminism. I've already mentioned her work in the previous lecture. The writer who most successfully transformed existentialist thinking into the form of fiction is Albert Camus. Camus himself disliked the label existentialism as coined by his colleagues, and he did not think of his novels as existentialist. Even so, his writings have become an important part of the movement. His major work is arguably L'Etranger, which can be translated as The Stranger or The Outsider. The novel's protagonist, Meursault, is profoundly unfeeling. The novel opens with his mother's funeral, at which he cannot bring himself to show any of the outward signs of grief. At a later and crucial moment in the plot, he shoots an Arab, without explaining why and without expressing remorse for his actions. Having grasped that the universe is indifferent to humankind, 
He finds a final happiness in his indifference towards the world and the lack of meaning he sees in everyone and everything. This appreciation of the absurdity of human life can be found in many later novels, such as Joseph Heller's Catch-22, which I will turn to at a later point. It can also be found in the novels and plays of Samuel Beckett, which I won't discuss for reasons of time. The third writer that must be mentioned as one of the founding figures of existentialism is Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre was the most important philosopher of existentialism. His philosophy begins with the notion that we were put on this earth without first being asked. As such, life does not have a meaning of itself. All meaning that can be found is man-made. On the one hand, this condition is a source of freedom. We are free to define ourselves. We can choose what we want to find meaning for. On the other hand, with this freedom comes a responsibility. The choices that we make do not only shape our own fate, but also that of the world. The task of literature, according to Sartre, was to make people think, choose and engage. Literature provides a laboratory, a testing ground, in which people can discover what is valuable and what isn't. In his novels, characters often find themselves in moments of crisis. They are out on their own and have to make choices on their own for which they will be held responsible. Today, Sartre's fame rests more on his theories than on his literary writings. His influence can be felt in present-day thinking about antinatalism, according to which it is morally wrong to create new sentient beings. That is a generous way of saying children. The heydays of existentialism may seem to be behind us. Even so, perhaps you can think of certain stories or works that refer to it or even address existentialism. Consider, for instance, the contemporary Netflix series Bojack Horseman, which is suffused with the ideas of existentialism. To get a taste, you might want to look at the conclusion of episode 3 and the beginning of episode 4 of series 3. You will find a link to these fragments underneath this video, and you can find the full version on Netflix. In this episode, the two protagonists, Bojack and Diane, are looking for Mr. Cuddly Whiskers, a producer who has mysteriously disappeared, and as his name suggests, he's a hamster. At the very end of the episode, they discover that Mr. Cuddly Whiskers has retreated to a cabin in the mountains. They confront him with his disappearance, and his response is a paraphrase of the main tenets of existentialism. I don't know what to tell you. I'm happy for the first time in my life. I'm not going to feel bad about it. It takes a long time to realize how truly miserable you are, and even longer to see that it doesn't have to be that way. Only after you give up everything can you begin to find a way to be happy. Notice the cup of tea, which here symbolizes the way in which Mr. Cuddly Whiskers has made peace with himself and with the world. Bojack is reaching for the cup of tea, but fails. Almost without missing a beat, the next episode continues this conclusion. We find Bojack on his way to an underwater city where he will promote his new film. He angrily calls his agent, asking why he couldn't go to the French film festival in Cannes, and she replies that he has alienated both the French public by publishing a negative article on the French philosopher Sartre, whose ideas, of course, form the background of Mr. Cuddly Whiskers' thinking. Just imagine that, a movie star publishing an article on Sartre. The ideas of existentialism are not limited to these three writers and the following that they created, but stretch back into the 19th century. I will give three important precursors and illustrate how their influence continues to reach into the present. According to most histories, existentialism is spearheaded by the work of the Danish poet and theologian Søren Kierkegaard. Like many later, later existentialists, Kierkegaard focuses on the individual experience of humans as a source of meaning. One of the central concepts in his work is the notion of anxiety. To visualize this concept, Kierkegaard gives the example of a man standing on the edge of a tall building. What do you think that the anxiety in such a case stems from? When the man looks over the edge, he experiences a focused fear of falling. But at the same time, the man feels a terrifying impulse to throw himself intentionally off the edge. That experience is anxiety or dread because one has complete freedom to choose either to throw oneself off or to stay put. The mere fact that one has the possibility and freedom 
to do something, even the most terrifying of possibilities, triggers immense feelings of dread. Again, this idea is still very much with us. Perhaps it is nowhere as present as in post-9-11 novels, that is, novels that refer to the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers, such as Don DeLillo's Falling Man or Ian McEwan's Saturday or Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad. Kierkegaard is not the only important precursor to existentialism. Just as important is the, is the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, whose work we discussed in the context of 19th century realism. His novels, however, are often also included in discussions of existentialism. As I mentioned before, art historical movements are retrospective in positions and are not mutually exclusive. One of Dostoevsky's short novellas, his Notes from the Underground, is probably his most existentialist work. The novel's narrator is an embittered man who delivers a monologue from his St. Petersburg's basement. The lower this alienated anti-hero sinks, the loftier his intellectual pontifications become. Man, he wonders, likes to create and lay down paths, that is indisputable, but why does he also love destruction and chaos so passionately? After a humiliating social occasion with old school friends, he pursues them, seeking revenge, but instead he meets a 20-year-old prostitute, Lisa, by whom he is both attracted and repelled. In his attempts at social and moral climbing, he digs himself into an ever deeper hole. Such a critique of the mind's presumed rationality also forms the backbone of contemporary dystopian fiction, from George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World to, more recently, Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. In the era of modernist literature, too, we find writers who adumbrate the concerns of existentialism. A case in point is the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke. Rilke's work revolves around the significance of death and the experience of time as death approaches. Many of you have read his poem on the archaic torso of Apollo in the course and text analysis. You may remember of this poem uh, that it begins as an ekphrasis. Its title signals that the poem will give the description of a work of art. As the poem proceeds, is this what we get? Gradually, the statue that is being described begins to bewitch the poet, and it becomes clear that it's not the poet who is looking and describing the work of art. Instead, those things that are missing from the artwork, it is, a, of course, a torso, a fragment, reassert their presence and begin to gaze at the poet. Rilke writes, Denn da ist keine Stelle, die die nicht sieht, which can be translated as, For here there is no place that does not see you. The poem's concluding lines are an ethical appeal that is so characteristic of later existentialism. Du musst dein Leben ändern. You must change your life. The encounter with the other, through art, changes the self, so Rilke seems to suggest. Rilke's poetry has exerted a tremendous influence. His influence can be detected, for instance, in the genre of confessional poetry. This type of lyric verse rose to prominence in the 60s and deals with the facts and intimate mental and physical experiences of the poet's own life. The poems of Sylvia Plath, for instance, are marked by the candor and sometimes shocking detail with which she reveals private or clinical matters about herself, including sexual experiences, mental anguish and illness, and suicidal impulses. Another genre in which Rilke's influence can be felt is the fairly recent genre of eco-poetry. Eco this subgenre of contemporary poetry was pioneered by the English poet and husband of Sylvia Plath, Ted Huge. As its name suggests, poems in this genre address ecological concerns, concerns which, since the turn of the century, have become increasingly tangible. Now, at the start of the second millennium, it is clear that we have been living in the Anthropocene, an era in which mankind's influence on the planet has become so significant that it equals the force of geological changes. While some scientists argue that this era began with the agricultural revolution, others suggest that it began with the detonation of the first atomic bomb in 1945. The contemporary Scottish poet John Burnside reflects on such ecological concerns in his poetry, and he asks what they might mean for us as individuals in a poem such as Confiteor. How would you describe the scenario that this particular poem creates? In this lyric, the poet has heard a call, a certain sound in the dead of night, which prompts him to go 
outside his home. This call comes from a source that seems to be otherworldly. A single cry it was, or so it seemed, though nothing I had recognised as native. Because of this call from another world, the landscape, or rather the poet's perspective on the landscape, is changed utterly. There might be snow, of course, but not like this. No hush between the fence line and the trees, no sense of something other close at hand, my dwindling torch being flickering between a passing indigo and Lux Eterna. The poet here presents himself as an existentialist subject, lonely and isolated. He feels caught between two worlds, between the earth and the present, and the eternal light, the light that shone in the earth as it was created. It's not a coincidence that Burnside here makes use of religious language. So did Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky and Rilke. These writers fall back on religious tropes not because they want us to believe in a traditional religious narrative. Rather, they see religion as a reservoir, a well of images from which we can draw inspiration in our attempts to understand our being in the world. The German philosopher Heidegger calls this kind of condition Dasein. This German word is usually translated in English as existence, but it literally means being there. With this concept, Heidegger intended to do away with the classical distinction between mind and body. Heidegger treats the human being as a unity. Stated more concretely, according to Heidegger, a human being inhabits the world as what might be called a milieu, or a presence. At bottom, I, as a human being, simply am the fact that there is a world, or as Burnside writes, forgive me if I choose not to believe the snow were to fall like this. To sum up, existentialism has become an incredibly important influence on contemporary literature. But what made it become such an important source? To answer this question, we must briefly turn to a historical context, which I've already mentioned, and which is seen by some as the start of the Anthropocene. I'm talking, of course, about the Second World War. I won't begin a discussion about the origins and development of the war, as this would take us too far. Instead, I would like to limit my discussion to the type or method of warfare that emerged during this war. The First World War was, on the Western Front, marked by trench warfare. Both sides constructed elaborate underground systems that approached each other along a front. Because of a revolution in firepower, which was not matched by similar advances in mobility, the two sides dug in and kept challenging one another with new and bigger forms of artillery. This constant exposure to intense bombardments without the possibility of escape resulted in a phenomenon known as shell shock. World War II, in contrast, was not a trench war, but a combined arms war, a method in which aircraft, infantry and tanks act in unison and in which speed and mobility were of the essence. One particular innovation in this regard was the role of airplanes and of bombers in particular. The Second World War was the first war in which airplanes played a massive and decisive role. Importantly, air warfare included not just the direct support of troops, but also the terror bombing of military and civilian targets. As a result, every civilian was transformed into a trench soldier. There was no knowing when or where a bomber would appear. You may recall that the novel by Camus with which I began La Peste was published in 1947, and indeed it is only now that this novel is being read as a form of pestilence fiction. In the past it was usually read as an allegory of occupied life in France during the Second World War. The virus, in other words, is an emblem of the bomb. One way in which we find this context reflected in literature after the war is in the emergence of a new kind of war writing. The protagonist of this kind of writing is not so much a trench soldier, but the bombardier, who was similarly required to suffer intense fire in an essentially fixed position with little recourse to action. Consider Joseph Hallett's 1961 novel Catch-22, widely seen as the most important American work of literature about the war and one of the great novels of the 20th century. It was recently adapted in a rather successful way in a series featuring George Clooney. Catch-22 tells the story of John Yossarian, a B-25 bombardier during his tour of duty in Italy. Yossarian's story is told through a complex interweaving of flashbacks that circle elliptically around his memory of a fellow crew member's death. Sophisticated as the narrative is, 
The essential story is simple and familiar. Yossarian experiences a traumatizing revelation of human mortality and then spends most of the novel striving to escape this knowledge. The novel's title refers to the paradox that this knowledge results in. Fearing for his life, Yossarian tries to fake insanity because an insane pilot will be relieved of duty. But by trying to be relieved of duty, he actually shows that he is sane. The more Yossarian tries to prove he's mad, the more, in fact, he proves his fitness as a war fighter. There is an even deeper paradox, however. Perhaps you can make an educated guess. What's paradoxical about Catch-22 is that the soldier is not just the victim of traumatic violence, but also an agent of superhuman destructive power deployed by one of the most powerful military forces ever seen. Men like Yossarian, flying B-25s, unleashed apocalyptic violence on Germany, Italy and Japan. This violence was incomprehensible in the scope of its destruction, and this is one of the critiques that one might level as existentialism, at least in some of its forms. By privileging the experience of the individual subject, it forgets about the existence and experience of the other. If you'd like to know more about this subject, I can heartily recommend a fantastic book about the subject by Roy Scranton. There are other ways in which the war had an influence on the kind of literature that was produced. In the handbook, Laszlo Muncian and Pedro Lang draw our attention to one element in particular, the destruction of cities by aerial bombardments. After the war, the urban landscape had changed utterly. All over Europe, and indeed all over the world, cities had been reduced to rubble by bombs dropped from airplanes. In the work of the Japanese Nobel Prize winner Kenzaburo Oe, for instance, we find existentialist themes worked out in the context of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In Germany, a new literary genre emerged, Trümmerliteratur, or Literature of the Rubble. Muntian and Lang discuss how in Heinrich Böll's The Silent Angel, material disintegration manifests itself in the lingering breath of the bomb. This damage cannot be repaired or undone. The amount of dust exponentially increases by cleaning. Muntian and Lange note that this insurmountable task is also a metaphor for the incapacity to process personal and collective traumas, as well as bearing witness to a Nazi past that would stain Germans for generations to come. Because of their focus on the city and city literature, Muntian and Lange do not linger on the specifics of this past. Which aspect of the Nazi past are they referring to? They are referring, of course, to the Shoah, also known as the Holocaust, the mass murder of Jews under the Nazi regime. Lucy Davidovitz has argued that Germany, in fact, fought two wars simultaneously, World War II against the Allies and the racial war against the Jews and other minorities. When Allied armies discovered the concentration camps in which people had been murdered in a systematic way, any remaining faith in the essential goodness of man evaporated. We can find an evocation of this trauma in one of the most haunting poems about the Second World War, Paul Celan's Todesfuge, or Death Fugue. This lyric presents a harrowing account of the experience of a concentration camp. How would you describe the feeling of this poem? What strikes you, in particular, about the language that is used? Celan's poem is quintessentially a choral lamentation, a cry of pain and suffering. The poem crafts a number of metaphors and contradictions to express something that cannot be represented. The black milk of daybreak that the captives must drink, for instance, is an image for the lethal gra gas of the concentration camp chambers. The reference to the smoke rising from the crematoria is even more pronounced. We are digging a grave, I quote, in the air. It is ample to lie there. In this poem, we are dealing with a paradox as well. As an aesthetic object, this poem is in fact exquisitely crafted. The dancing rhythm, the fugal, fugal structure, the imagery, this play with the German language make this in many ways a poem of pure sound. At the same time, no poem could be more attached to the horrific reality of the Shoah. The German critic Theodor Adorno declaimed that to write modern poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. But this hasn't stopped poets from trying to come to terms with this event through the medium of language.
The horror of the Showa was a catalyst for the remembrance of other atrocities. As Michael Rothberg has argued, the emergence of Holocaust memory on a global scale has contributed to the articulation of other histories, some of them predating the Nazi genocide, such as slavery, and others taking place later, such as the Algerian War of Independence or the genocide in Bosnia during the 1990s. We find such an intersection in many novels. I'd like to close this lecture by mentioning Jonathan Seffron Foer's Everything is Illuminated, published in 2002, and his Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, published in 2005. The first novel is the fictionalised history of a Jewish chattel in Poland, where his grandfather, the grandfather of the novelist, was born. The second novel revolves around 9-11, that is, the terror attacks on the World Trade Centre. While the focus lies on this particular collective trauma, the novel also dwells on the experience of the Dresden bombings during the Second World War, thus uncovering historical relatedness and working through the partial overlaps and conflicting claims that constitute the archives of memory and the terrain of politics. In this oeuvre, then, the oeuvre by Jonathan Seffrin Foer, the Shoah, the American terror bombing of German cities and the Al-Qaeda attacks on the Twin Towers or interwoven. In the next lecture, we will talk more about Seebald's Austerlitz, which addresses the Shoah as well, but in a very different way. The Second World War and its atrocities had a tremendous influence on in contemporary literature. Nobody who survived the war was not affected. In fact, nobody who survived the war was not lonely, anxious or isolated. So it is this context which explains why existentialism became such an important movement after the Second World War. The themes and forms of existentialism allowed writers to form an emotional response to a condition that everybody was facing. I hope that this fairly long talk has given you some insight into the themes and forms of this particular movement within contemporary literature. The field of contemporary literature is so rich and fascinating that I can only lift a tip of the veil. If I had to single out one thematic aspect that unifies the works I talked about today, then it would be a high degree of sincerity. Existentialist writers treat complex subjects with a high degree of seriousness in the hope that it will prompt their readers to make morally informed decisions. To this end, they often draw, draw on their own real-life experiences. This honesty is mirrored in the form of existentialist writing which is marked by the realist assumption that language can adequately represent reality. By trying to thus communicate a philosophical message to the reader, this form of literature may have a therapeutic effect. Let me illustrate this final point and close this lecture by returning to the text with which we began, The Plague by Camus. At a certain point during the quarantine, the narrator gives us the following reflection. It is a heart-wrenching description of one's state of mind during a quarantine, yet I think the advice with which it concludes might heighten our self-awareness, and thus remind us that in our minds, at least, we are free. Thus, too, they came to know the incorrigible sorrow of all prisoners and exiles, which is to live in company with a memory that serves no purpose. Even the past, of which they thought incessantly, had a savour only of regret for they would have wished to add to it all that they regretted having left undone, while they might yet have done it, with the man or woman whose return they now awaited. Just as in all the activities, even the relatively happy ones of their life as prisoners, they kept vainly trying to include the absent one. And thus, there was always something missing in their lives. Hostile to the past, impatient of the present, and cheated of the future, we were much like those whom men's justice or hatred forced to live behind prison bars. Thus, the only way of escaping from that intolerable leisure was to set the trains running again in one's imagination and in filling the silence with the fancied tinkle of a doorbell, in practice obstinately mute. I sometimes joke after a class that I will answer all questions except existentialist ones. This class obviously is an exception. So I'm very much looking forward to your responses and queries in the discussion forum. Thank you for watching.